everybody. This is Jennifer Filson. Welcome to Connecting with Jennifer Filson. I have Monty Jamari on the line with me. Woo! All right. <laughs> and Monty and I know each other through dance. Mm -hmm. uh, that's how we got to know each other. But then, like, you know, there's so much more to this wonderful human being that we're talking to today. So, um, in fact, I've always known him as Monty, and I even had to say, you know, okay, honey, how do you pronounce your first name again? <laughs> how do you say it, Monty? So, um, I say Montreal. Um, the way that Jen pronounces it is Montreal, and that's how my mother pronounces it. I love that. <laughs> Hi, Mom. I'm keeping up, exactly. the, keeping up the standards. Exactly. Yeah, <laughs> Now, here's a fun thing. Like, so Monty is is always a, a, a nice nickname for it. But did you have other nicknames growing up? Uh, yeah, it was Trail or Mont. Um, Big Papa is another one. I like oh. that one. Awesome. <laughs> Just joking. No, nobody called me Big Papa. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> the drumming instructor name was Papa B. So yeah. I, Papa yeah. B. <laughs> mm -hmm. Papa, B. It was Papa B. Papa B. Yeah, that's the first for me. I haven't heard that one. Yeah, he was the one that taught me how to play drums. Way back oh, yeah. I didn't know you knew how to play drums. Yeah, yeah. When I, I, okay, so here's the funny story about my drumming career, which really mm -hmm. wasn't a career. It was just a, it was the hobby that was just so much fun. Mm -hmm. When I was a kid growing up, my parents' best friends were, um, we lovingly, I lovingly called them Uncle Bob and Aunt Carol. And their mm -hmm. daughter, Piper, was my best friend. And Uncle Bob was a an ophthalmologist by day, jazz drummer by night. And Aunt Carol was an opera singer. And their daughter, Piper, who was my best friend, was a ballet dancer. Mm -hmm. So this is an incredibly talented family. And they truly shaped a lot of my musical journey because my parents are musicians as well. They played folk music. So I grew up with them with our guitars sitting mm -hmm. around the coffee table and we would all sing. Mm -hmm. But I actually got a college scholarship on opera and it was because oh, wow. of my influence with Aunt Carol, right? Yeah. And I remember seeing Uncle Bob's like jazz drum kit like it was it was big with oh, it had all the stuff and I just wanted to sit and play and I didn't know what I was doing I mm -hmm. just wanted to like I just wanted to do this yeah and I was like, please can I have some drums and my parents were like oh oh no 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 <laughs> no so I had to wait until I was 30 years old and I wanted to, I finally had the opportunity to play the drums and I got myself a little a little tiny jazz sonar kit so it was like a five piece kit nice mm -hmm. little compact thing i even had like the neoprene pads yeah. um, that were quieter it would like mute the sound mm -hmm. so when i practiced i didn't like you know hurt anybody's ears but yeah drumming was something i loved and papa b is a guy that um, i hired to come to my house and he was my teacher for like about a year mm -hmm. and i really really liked it but you know what uh I'm not that great, but I had fun. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, I know that I know what Renee should get you for Christmas. <laughs> Do you drum at all? You know, I um, I play bass bass oh, guitar. Oh, the connection died. Okay, okay. Yeah. Yeah, and um, you do. Yeah, I play I bass. I know that. Yep. <laughs> bass yep. and drums, man. That's so cool. When did you start playing bass guitar? Um, I started uh, years ago when I was uh, going, when I was just a kid, I used to play in church a, a lot. And then I was just really into, you know, just the whole, there's just a different genre when it comes to bass guitarist. And so I was always intrigued by it and uh, just fell in love with the bass. <clears throat> and then I just kept, uh, kept at it. And it's just something that I just was really passionate about. Um, got a chance to meet some pretty well. One popular bass guitarist. It was his. His name is Victor Wooten, and he got a chance to sign my bass guitar. So, if you get a check, chance to check him out, he's on Bela Fleck and Fleck Tones. He's really good. 
yeah, I came up to Chico to do a base clinic. So that was pretty awesome. That is so cool. Oh yeah. my God. Yeah. You. Yeah. My Actually, favorite. I played bass with, uh, with Leafy Green at, at one of our um, uh, West Coast Swing conferences. And Did we were, really? yeah, we we're on stage. Yeah. Yep. Oh my gosh. Shout out, shout out to Leafy Green. I haven't seen him in a long time. Yeah, is he still around? Uh, I think he has, uh, I think he's married and has a kid and got the family life going. I think that's what he's doing now. I'm not quite sure. I haven't talked to him in a while. Came over and stayed the night at my house and and we hung out for a while too. So, good guy. Good guy. Yeah. Oh, that's so cool. You can still play it. Bass is so amazing. My favorite bassist of all time is Jacko Pistorius. Oh my gosh, yeah. Right? Yeah, genius. Yeah. Oh. His song, Portrait of Tracy, the one he did about his wife. Oh, yeah. yeah. I love that song. I could listen to that all day. And it's so, like, it's so different. Right. Yeah. He's a, he's a total genius. Yeah. We lost we yeah. lost a, a talented person at a young age. Yeah. Um, he was really young, too. Wasn't he? I think it was in his uh, late 20s or 30s or something like that. I don't remember. Young. He was pretty young. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, talented. Ooh, so talented. Mm -hmm. I uh, I wouldn't mind picking up the. <sighs> okay, so I've got this love hate thing with guitar. At period, mm -hmm. the, the, yeah. the guitar strings hurt. They they really yeah. hurt my. <laughs> Both of my parents are guitarists. And they're like, don't you want to play guitar? And I'm like, yeah. ow. Yeah. <laughs> they do hurt. Yeah. But at the same time, when um. I was forming my very first band with my first husband and our friends. Mm -hmm. I remembered um, picking up my friend's bass and he taught me some stuff and I could actually play a song. Like I was so excited, Monty. So actually oh, like, cause you know, I'm just used to either singing or drumming yeah. and no mm -hmm. other instruments. And, and my, my talents on the keyboard, no, no. Yeah. I've <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, uh, Prince, uh, Prince, said that bass is spelled B-A-S-E, not B-A-S-S -S, when it comes to the band. You know, it's the foundation. And so uh, he was an awesome bassist too. And, and a lot of uh, stuff that he learned from Larry Graham um, and uh, from different other other old funk bass guitarists, you know, so he was, he was a big influence too on, on my music. Nice. Oh my yeah. gosh. I want to hear you play. Yeah. Yeah, we'll, 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 have to, we'll have to set that up sometime. <laughs> Once I get a new, new amp. We'll call it the Mont, Mont, Monty and Jen uh, jam out session. <laughs> oh, I, I really was into my drum for a while. I even I even played the doom back and mm -hmm. I, I played for belly dancers. For a while. Oh wow! Yeah. Yeah, and and then like I just you know when I moved here to Monterey, we've got you know neighbor upstairs here in the oh, yeah. yeah. There's no space, and it's drums are unfortunately not a quiet. Right. Yeah. Regardless of how good you are at that, it's just you know, and I tried so hard to like you know keep drumming. Nah, it just it, no. So I'll, yeah. maybe. Some I'll pick it up again, but mm -hmm. you know, the funny thing about, okay, so with us dancing, mm -hmm. you know, setting up to go dancing is like, mm -hmm. you bring your shoes, you put yeah. your shoes on, right. and that's it. Now, yeah. if you're running the dance thing, okay, you bring your, you bring your speaker, mm -hmm. you bring yeah. your, yeah. Or mm -hmm. your, your iPad or whatever you got, and your yeah. shoes. Right. Really? Yeah. It doesn't take much. Yeah. But like taking your drum kit or even your bass. Well, you've got your amp, your monitor, mm -hmm. and your bass and all that, right? But mm -hmm. with drums, oh my gosh, right? You got cymbals, you <laughs> got the stands, you got the kick, you got the drums, you got the stool. Yeah. Like, oh, so, so much. You have to yeah. set up. And then, yeah. and then you have to have everything precisely within, in, within. Yeah inch of where you need to be or you're missing things right no thank you I, yeah yeah <laughs> you know the, 
drums are pretty awesome. I, you know, I started off. That's why I started off was playing drums. <laughs> Super fun. I enjoyed it. Yeah. Yeah. How did you get into dance? Well, um, boy, I think it was um, that was back in two thousand and eight. Uh, the October 2008 and I think I was going through a lot of different uh, events in my life it was like a big t big uh, transition and so when I found well when I found West Coast Swing or West Coast Swing found me rather um, you know it was just something that just kind of took me and then you know just kind of carried me through a kind of a tough time in my life at that time and it was Diego. He was one of my friends. He uh, invited me to go to uh, salsa one night. It was at it was at the Holiday Inn, and then I met the owner at, of uh, Studio One. <clears throat> and actually, um, that night I, I was hitting on his girlfriend. And I didn't know it. <laughs> yeah, and uh, <laughs> and I was doing pretty good. I, I was doing pretty good. And then. Um, so anyway, the, he came over, Luke came over, and uh, we just started talking, and um, and we became really good friends. And then he invited me to come over to do West Coast Swing, and so from then on, I just got hit with the West Coast Swing bug, and it was just uh, it was like nothing else that I've ever experienced. So that's how I got started. I love it. Two thousand eight. Yeah. So did you have any prior dance experience to West Coast Swing? Um, when I was a kid, I used to do hip hop dancing, and I used to <clears throat> win break dance contest, and used to get little trophies. Of course and so, you did. Yeah, yeah, so it was what? super fun. Yeah. A talented dancer. Oh my God, seriously. Mm, yeah. That's so cool. Did you do the spinning on the head or just the spinning on the? Oh, I did all of that. All of that yeah. spinning on the head, the back, the knee. Um, I did the pose once it was over. You know, the whole thing. <laughs> Great. <laughs> yeah, that whole thing. Yeah. Oh my yeah. gosh! I, I so wish I had the um, the strength. Like I, I could do the cockroach, as I called it. Like you take the leg and you swing around your back, and we, you know, okay. that was about. Renee was into it too when he yeah. was a kid. Because mm -hmm. it break dancing, man, that was like that was the shit. Yeah. It was like 1980s, the late 80s. Right. Right. Oh man. Um. The movie Breaking came came out. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Breaking, breaking to Beach Street, you know, all of that those days. I was just mm -hmm. totally into it. And then Michael Jackson came out later on and he started doing the moonwalk and his dance moves and everything. It was just something else. Yeah. Oh no. Yeah. It's yeah. it's so 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 your friend Diego, he took you salsa dancing how long did that last that was just that one night and then that was it you were ushered uh, straight. yeah i think i went a couple other nights too it's, it's also super fun but it's not like west coast swing you know there's right. there's nothing like it you know so they're just two different types of uh genres and so west coast swing there's so much freedom in it and um super complicated at first <laughs> then because there's so much that goes into it like you yeah. understand, right? Oh, right. Yeah. How do you explain it to people who are not West Coast Swing dancers? Oh boy. Because well, I have my own ways of describing it, but like I'm always fascinated to see how other people describe it. How do they describe West Coast Swing? Goodness. Um, you know, it for me that's a challenge. It's a challenge to describe how West Coast Swing is. Because it's um, it's elastic and it can be really very gooey. Um, definitely a partner dance. You know, you can't really do West Coast Swing by yourself. Um, there's a you know you have there's like some it's intuitive. Sexy. It's so sexy. It really is. I mean, gosh, look at it. You know, and that is inherent in the dance, right? So, I mean, just the way that the triple steps work and the hips, you know, for a woman, it's just, it's crazy, you know? Mm -hmm. So, and then the way that the, the dance breathes, you know, goes back and forth and stretches and comes back in and, and then keeping the timing of it, you know, 
the up and down, the pulse of the music. And then if you're able to stay behind the beat just so slightly, it makes it that much more smoother, you know? So it gives it this kind of gliding effect, you know? So, yes. yeah. That's I remember, go ahead. Well, well, okay, so like when I say it's a sexy dance, but uh -huh. it's not sexy. It's like it's like not. sexy, but not sexual. You know what I mean? It's not like hey, not me. It's not right, like that. Right. Right. But it it just it's like it's like a it's like a really. It's I th I think of it as a, a three minute love affair. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Love affair and we can be as expressive and as flirtatious in the music as we want to be, mm -hmm. and as like. Okay, that was great. Thanks, Monty. Next. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. There's no like, hey, baby, want to go to my room afterward? I mean, you know, like, yeah. like it's like, oh, yeah. this over there. Yay, you know. Right, just right. No divorce papers, no marriage proposals. <laughs> no. no, it's not. So uh, that's been my thing is I try to give the best three minute uh, love affair that I can. You know. And you do. You well, do, darling. You all oh have the best dances with you. I'm like, I'm always searching for you. Where, where is he? Where is he? Oh, there he is. And then I like go and find you because like there's a line of ladies. Oh, a come line. On. <laughs> yeah. Oh but my god. I know. Same thing with Renee. I have to get in line for my own damn husband. <laughs> yeah, he's awesome. He is. Yeah, I That's think. What, uh, I what's leave that? because. I learned that I can't I can't keep waiting for you or Renee or to dance with yeah. me. So I started oh, to gotcha. I never sit down. Hey, you know, uh, I was going to ask you about your, the drumming and like how you, um, it must be tough for you to uh, dance with someone that may be struggling with being offbeat and then you being a, <laughs> you being a drummer, keeping time. So how, how is that? I know that's a big problem with women. You know, in West Coast Swing, because of the, the offbeat. Well, I mean, it's it's kind of like a yeah, it it is it is a, it is a challenge, and and when you're following, you know, you want to be respectful of the fact that you're following, you're not leading. But I've discovered that when I just really have a good secure connection, and I just really am clear as far as what the timing is. Mm -hmm. I can usually back lead the timing. So if the, if the leader gets off time, he can get back on time because I'm like. Yeah. But, yeah. but, but it wasn't always the case, you know, it's taken me. Okay. Let's see. I started doing West Coast swing in 2000, 2005, 2006. Mm -hmm. Oh my gosh. Has it been 15 years? <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, I'm just realizing how, how long it's been. Oh my, I should be better than I am, Monty. No, you're great. You're great. Come on. Uh, uh, <laughs> yeah, wait till you see me now. I'm not practicing. Um, um, yeah, okay. you're doing great. Um, yeah, but no, I mean, I uh, I didn't know how to establish that. But then again, I still had to. You're right. It is a difficult dance. It is a very difficult mind bending dance. The way I explain it to people is it's like jazz. Jazz is a very complicated music and mm. you, ha you have to know the rules, but you improvise. And that's mm. what I love about it. I can be expressive and improvise. And as long as I stay within the framework of the rules, I can do anything I want. Yeah. As long as it is within a partnership, you know, it's not like, Hey, I'm just going to be like dancing all by myself. And like this yeah. guy's attached to my hand. I want to yeah. be a good, I'm like you. I want to give that person the best three minutes they've ever had. Like I just really, I really go out there and I want to smile and I want to like. So the people this turned into a into a dance discussion, but hey, that's what it is. Um, uh -huh. If you don't know me, for one of my signature moves that I do all the time, I don't oh, smoke. Yeah. But when I'm on the dance floor, I always, oh, that was hot. I do my little, my little imaginary cigarette thing whenever somebody does that, does something cool. And I'm like, ooh, that was hot. That would be fabulous. And, and 
And people are like, you know, kind of like, you're going to die of cancer. I'm like, I'm smoking an imaginary cigarette. What am I going to die of? Cancer, <laughs> boy? Like, imaginary cigarette. But you can't buy me. You can't make me do that. Like, it, it just comes out. It's like, it's like oh, a smile. Right. Something. I'm just like, ooh, that was fabulous. Like, that's yeah. just my And it <laughs> cracks the guys up when I'm dancing with they laugh. Great. <laughs> and I think that's actually my my superhero power. Yeah. Like, yeah. they make people laugh and they have a good uh, time. Yeah. And and so it's not intimidating. But, it, mm. but yeah, it's like, you just... And and then and then here's the funny thing, Monty. When I don't whip out the cigarette, the magic in a dance, and they're like, right. "You didn't give me a cigarette." Oh, I know, I know that must be tough. I know that has to be hard. Yeah, I know that because that is your thing. I'll see you from way across the dance floor, and if I see the cigarette move, oh man, you know, I know, I know it was a great great dance, and I know the song, and I know the song kind of songs that you like. And then I'll I'll kind of just peep at you to see, and if it doesn't happen, I'm like, ah, oh, that guy's destroyed. Yeah, <laughs> he has to <laughs> he has to go build back up his dance ego. I'm telling you, oh my you know, God, that's um, you know, crush. Ah. You gotta get the cigarette. If a woman doesn't give you the cigarette, oh, <laughs> you gotta go back to the drawing board, buddy. Ooh, look at this! Wow. I'm so good. That is hilarious. Yeah, you know what? There's it, it's 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 like and, and here's the thing, Monty. I know that I know that we eventually have to like start talking about you. Look, <laughs> I hope you can edit most of it. I knew this was gonna happen. Right, we can edit. But truly, okay. though, like seriously, dancing is such a huge part of our lives, is it not? It is. Right? Yeah. Like, like you know, amateurs don't go to Maui. On a yearly basis. Uh, no, you know I mean? no, like, we don't. yeah. We are, we are in it to win it, right? And, and just are. much joy. But like, oh my God, like, is it going to be like? Yes, of course, the community will still be around, but how much? Like, here's here's my oh. thought. Yeah. Okay, we rent from a church. That's mm -hmm. where we do our classes once a month. Oh. Yeah. We back in the day when we were doing this 10 years ago, we were doing like, you know, weekly classes, but it's got yeah. to a point. OK, once a month, because, you know, we're busy. <laughs> we're the right. ones that are retired yet. Yeah. <clears throat> now, if the church goes out of business because churches aren't getting people to come. Yeah. Are we going to a dance venue? And then and then like Sly McFly's. And how they've got live music every night. And she goes, like, we're so lucky on the Monterey Peninsula because we've had live music forever, every single night of the week. Yeah. Is it going to come back? Like, yeah. yeah. Like, I don't even know. And right. and now, and I think I told you when we were on the phone the other day, like, I want to build my dream house just so I can have a ballroom in it. And no one can tell me oh, I yeah. can't have a dance party. Right. Yeah. 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 Well, here, here's the thing that I think you know, about the, about it. I think there's definitely going to be a, an evolution of the dance community. Um, it's not going to be the same as it was before. And it's not, it's not a bad or, you know, or, or, you know, something that can be classified as bad or good. It's just what it is. I think that um, one thing about West Coast Swing and those people who are truly um, into it is like what you mentioned before is the passion behind it because you can't destroy the passion, you know, so it's going to find a way, right? Uh, it'll find a way. Life normally does, right? Life finds a way. Even in the biggest catastrophe, you're always going to find that flower out in the middle of uh, nowhere, just kind of just shooting up a little seed, you know? And so that's what I believe about West Coast Swing. It just can't be destroyed. It can't be um, suppressed. It's just going to be because of the passion, the heart, and the fervor that's in, you know, like what we're talking about now. You know, that, that, those things can't die. So it'll, it'll find a way. It'll find a way. Mm -hmm. Oh, you're such a poet. Did you know it? You're so good. That's what my mom tells me. <laughs> Where's your mommy? Is she is she in Chico? Uh she's in uh she lives in Sacramento. Yeah. yeah. She lives in Sacramento. Yeah, we talk all the time. Um 
but she she lives in Sacramento and uh, and she comes up here. She actually she came here. Her, my sister, my uh, niece and nephew came to stay with me for a little bit. So it was pretty nice. Nice. Yeah, yeah, good woman. Yeah. Yeah. And your dad, he's still, he's still on the continent, right? No, he lives in Sacramento also, uh, oh, but some yeah. Some over there, I don't know why. Right, yeah, but um, yeah, he's still here. And for those folks out there that don't know, my dad, is he's Kenyan. And uh, he came here on a scholarship back in the 70s. And uh, at the, on scholarship. Yeah, on a scholarship. Wow. OK, gotcha. Mm hmm. <clears throat> yeah. And mom, mom's family has been around for generations. Well, they, they came from uh, Carthage, Texas. Um, so they came here when my mother was a little girl, came to Butte County area. And uh, my grandfather was looking for work during that time, you know, because they were really poor. And his sister came out here to California and, and told him to come on out because uh, there's more work out here. And so uh, he traveled out here with his uh, little family and, um, you know, he started a church in Orville about 50, 60 years ago, something like that. It's been a while. And um, yeah, and he started working. A natural orator. It comes oh. in family. Yeah, you know, I, I've been around it all my life, and uh, my grandfather in in uh, Kenya, before he passed, he was a he was a pastor also. <laughs> and oh my, yeah. Yeah, my uncle and everybody else. So it kind of runs in the family. Now your dad um, coming over from Kenya, like that that was huge in the seventies. That's that's a yeah. big. But what's so nice is that if I if I recall from our past conversations, he's really instilled a lot of the African traditions in you, and so you also use that. So let's let's talk about you and what you do. Okay. This is gonna, okay yeah. So let's just pick it off with the question: What makes you special and unique? I know we've kind of sort of hinted at it, but what makes you yeah. special? Come on, baby, tell me. Well, my father, you know, I guess yeah, just having that different type of cultural background. It's pretty unique. Um, for most African American folks here in this country, they don't know their African roots, you know. So there's that part of them that is kind of missing, you know, that a lot of people experience. So with myself, <clears throat> um, I felt like there was like a circle that was incomplete because my mother, and my grand, my mother and my father, they divorced when I was a kid, and so. But I do kind of remember a little bit about him. Um, you know, I can, I remember speaking the language and things like that when I was just a little boy, you know, and, and everybody else, you know, they used to have African get togethers here a lot. Um, so, uh, then I reconnected with him when I was 13 years old. Um, and it's been kind of off and on thing, but the, the push was from my mother's side, you know, to understand my African side of the family. And so uh, I started connecting with my aunt Sarah. She was like a, a like a surrogate mother to me. That's my my dad's cousin, who's uh, 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 yeah. So she would be like a gosh, it gets complicated in African culture because you're related to everybody, you know, on Mofangano Island. So long story short, my mother really pushed for it, and um, and I went back to Kenya and um, started to learn a little bit more about my African culture on my uh, grandfather's side, my dad's side. And um, I learned a whole lot of those. And I brought that back and I started to use that into my practice, you know, just a little bit. Those the kind of what, what kind of applies when I'm there with the person, you know. So um, a lot of it is more of a, a collective um, collective framework when it comes to the family. So it's not so much the individual like it is here in, in the United States, like the individual is the one to go out and try to get what he or she can get, you know, whereas most cultures <clears throat> in particular are the family is, uh, is behind that person, you know, it's like, so it's not, it's not just that one individual. Um, so I learned a whole lot of those type of qualities. Um, and then I was able to, before my grandfather had passed, he called for me 
because my grandmother, I went back there and I saw my grandmother and I got a chance to, to meet with her. And then she passed away after I left. My grandfather then called for me. Again, it was a beautiful experience. You know, I got a chance to see, walk the roads that my 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 dad walked when he was just a little kid. And my grandmother and I, we held hands on that trail. She said, this is where Atunda used to go up. You know, she said it in her language. And my uncle Ellie there was there to interpret my dad's brother. She said, this is where Atunda used to go to his school. And he used to take this little path here and he used to run home this way, you know, and then we traveled that way. We met um, her sister on that on that path. And uh, they said, my other African name is Odiambo, means, you know, someone that was born, I think it's during the sunset or sunrise, I can't remember. But um, they said, Odiambo, you did such a good thing coming back to see the people, you know, we're so proud of you. You're, you did a good thing with for your grandfather and your grandmother. You brought honor to your family by coming back and from the United States. And so I got a chance to see that, see, see uh, her side of the family, her sister, and, and they told stories. Um, I went to see the uh, Itone, the rock art. It's like 10,000 years old. And um, yep, on Mofangano Island, all the indigenous people. So there's a lot of whole rich history and power that's there and all of the folklore. <clears throat> so some of that I kind of bring into my therapeutic practice along with you know, my uh, formal education from Chico State, you know, in the master program with psychotherapy. And so I kind of evolved into, you know, to something that's a little bit different and it's inclusive. It's not just for black folk or white people or whoever, you know, it's, it's everybody um, because that's what I kind of gathered from, from that there's a soul connection. just like how you and I connect, you know, and Renee, <clears throat> you know, there's just that connection that's there, right? Mm -hmm. um, so. Part of it is like um, it's an old Native American saying where they they uh, their greeting is I see you, right? Um, that I see you means it's not just that the beautiful outside that you have, right? But it's just everything about who you are. I see into your soul as well. See into your soul, yeah. Your experience, your hurt, your pain, your good times, all that the things that make up you. I'm being present with you right now. You know, I'm not being distracted by my phone or anything as you're talking. <clears throat> I'm right there with you. You know, so these are the things that I brought back from from Mafangano Island, um, off of, in Kenya. Um, and then also my grandfather, he gave me the history. He said, Well, you know, I asked him, and I never will forget it. Um, I put this in in my book, actually. I talked about it. But I wanted to know my history, and so I told, I asked uh, my uncle Ellie to ask my grandfather in in Alul language. That's the language that we speak, and about the fam, you know, where did where did I come from, you know? Because I was like I was telling you that circle was still left open, you know, because my I didn't learn too much from my father, you know, but I was on this hunt to understand a little bit more about who I am as a person. Sure. And so uh, it was. It was late at night. <clears throat> the door was open. You know, there was a. The door was open. The little chickens had come into the house with their little chicks, <laughs> and they oh, nested. In, yeah, it was so cute. They came and nested in the corner of the house. Um, my my cousins, they were sitting down, you know, against the wall, and then my grandfather and my grandmother were sitting next to each other there. And I'm at the table. We just had finished eating. My uncle Ellie was sitting there in this, this kerosene lamp, you know, because they don't have power there. And so I asked him that question and then he uh, he says, OK, um, he just looked at me and then he started smiling. And uh, he told my uncle Ellie to get out a piece of paper. And um, he started talking and he says, uh, your father is Michael Jamari. And his father is Janidus Jamari, meaning himself. And then my father is, you know, I, uh, I think his name is Itune. And then um, the same as like the, the rock art, I think that's his, his name. And then he went down from, <laughs> he went down through all of his forefathers. He said, now his father was this one, and his father was this one, and his father was this one, and his father was this one. Here's his father. And so this whole 
memorized oral tradition that he went back, gosh, about four or 500 years, you know? And he said, now you came, we came from Egypt down through the Nile River to the Sudan. From the Sudan, we went to, um, to Kenya. The two brothers came to Kenya. And then one brother's on one side, who's my aunt, who I was telling you about, that's his dad, her father's people. And then on our side here, <clears throat> oh, actually, I'm sorry, we're on the same side. So those, but they split off into different areas. And okay. so, uh, so anyway, so all the people on one side of the island is my relatives. On the other side of the island are people that I'm allowed to marry if I wanted to, right? So <laughs> I remember- Dude, going, and friends. Yeah. Oh I'm, not my God. Oh, I'm not related to you. Great. I can date you. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. And I remember I was like looking at this girl when I first stepped off. I was like, man, who is that? You know, to my, my uncle. And then he just kind of looked at me and he started laughing. He says, nah, he said, that's your cousin. You can't, you can't do that, buddy. <laughs> you know? He said, you, you can go on the other side of the island, but not, not here. You know, so it was funny. It was pretty funny. Everybody. I mean, good Lord. I was like, gosh. <laughs> Is that a really big island? Probably the size of Maui. Yeah, the size of Maui. Oh, okay. Wow, that is big. Yeah, good size. Yeah. Yeah. I'll be darned. Can I date her? Nope. Can I date her? Nope. How about her? No. No, no, no. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) The fact that you're, talk about a, 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 a cultural treasure that your grandfather knew all of that like i'm lucky if i can remember five generations let alone like wow Uh, that's were you recording all this like how do you remember all that well um i still have i have the paper that my uncle ellie wrote and then my grandfather signed it um and so i have it here at my i have it in my desk and um, it's, you know, I was showing everybody on my, my dad's side of family said, this is something super special, you know, not everybody has this. And, uh, you know, my grandfather, before he passed, he left, he left that legacy behind for me. So, so I was really, yeah. so the, your question about what makes me unique or special, I think that's the thing that stands out to me the most is the story. Oh, honey, there's so much special about you. Oh my gosh. <laughs> you're, you're fabulous. You okay? Well, let's. You know what? We've, we've kind of talked around it, but you are a therapist. Let's talk about that. How did you get into? And, and, and I know I'm not giving it the correct name. What is the proper title of your of your career? And how did you get into that? Uh, I'm a licensed marriage and family therapist. Um, so I think it was the same thing with West Coast Swing. It was one of those things that just kind of found me. It was like I was good at it. I re- remember wanting to do robotics engineering, and that was something I was really passionate about. Um, really? Early on. Oh, yeah. I, I used to make little robots, and that was like my, um, what is it, show and tell? Like a show and tell? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, not quite like that, but almost. <laughs> Yeah, so I'm a, I'm I'm a licensed marriage and family therapist. How long have you been practicing? Well, um, as a clinician for the county, um, I started off as a mental health worker. Um, that was in 2001, and uh, went from clinician, or I mean, I'm sorry, a mental health worker to mental health counselor to clinician. So. I went back during that time and and, and uh, received my degree at Chico State, at Simpson, and then Chico State was is where I got my master's degree. So uh, that was 18 years that I was in mental health, and then um, then in 2018 is when I passed the test to, and that was a big deal. This is really difficult. Um, 2018 is when I start. I branched off and left the county and did private practice. Wow. Yeah. Do you have any? I mean, it's it's a big deal to branch off and to mm-hmm. leave the comfort of 
a pension and and regular money to like yeah. go into your own practice. Mm -hmm. What have you found to be the most wonderful result of that decision? Freedom. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now you get the, to select to work with, right? Absolutely. And I get to um, incorporate the things that I feel that it, it would benefit humanity. You know, so I'm not bound by any, uh, you know, bureaucracy or things like that. Even though, you know, uh, the county, it gave me the, the foundation, the groundwork, the experience, you know, because I worked in uh, it, for the mental health facility, the lock facility for a number of years and mobile crisis. You know, you're there in between life and death when someone wants to commit suicide and things to that nature. So and I've just seen so much and experienced so much. So all of that experience gave me, you know, all of the tools that I need for to incorporate that into private practice. So for myself, it is uh, the freedom to be able to do the work that I want to do with the people, you know, that I see on a daily basis. So um, and I'm able to, you know, uh, think about the things that I feel like is, is helpful to them and not what um, you know, the government or anything like that says that I should do, you know, and that's the language I try to stay away from is that should language because it's more you're controlled. You know, you should do this. You should do that. You know, it's that limiting language. And um, so with myself, I just don't I couldn't see myself being limited all, all my life. I wanted that freedom. And so that's part of what, you know, my, you know, going into my own business and and being uh, my own therapist, be my own person, uh, led me is, is that freedom. Yeah. That is so, yeah, you, you are such a treasure. I mean, you dance, you play bass, you're a licensed family therapist. Oh, yeah. <laughs> your, your, uh, your background is phenomenal. You're super, uh, you are, you've always been so beautifully spoken. Um, mm. I just, I just love it when I. It's because I'm a writer. I write for a living, right? So when I hear a felt, when I hear prose through the oratory uh, mm -hmm. tradition, it's like, oh, there's a fellow writer. And yes, yeah. here you are. You finished your book. What's it called? Yep. Uh, the book is called uh, The Inner Critic. Um, the subtitle is the A Practical Guide for uh, to o Overcoming and Understanding the Conflicts of the Mind. So, That's so a big, big topic. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's you. That? That's that's a lot to unpack, Monty. You know, uh, it's going to be a part two to that book. It really is because I tell you, Jen, it, it just there's just so much. All the stuff that we're talking about, it just so much, and it goes off into different areas. And so the challenge was to. Uh, try to stay focused on on a few topics that I felt that was really um, meaningful to me, and uh, that I really want the audience to to understand. You know that they can overcome certain obstacles. You know, the, but that inner critic is just it's just massive, and I just see it all the time, all the time. All of That's, us, every oh, yeah. single one of us, has this going on. What Absolutely. Do you think you're doing? <laughs> yeah. Yep. Yep, absolutely. Yeah. And where does that voice come from is the next question. You know, how is it how is it nurtured? Right? Who how is it fed? Does it go back? And yeah, I mean there's God, there's so much to unpack with that topic. Ooh, that's like encyclopedia material. Absolutely. Yeah. And it's not the first, you know, I, I didn't coin the inner critic. I mean, this is a very popular not popular, you know, it's, it's a very common, yeah. So everybody has their different take on, on where the inner critic comes from, but there's certain foundations that are, that are generally the same, you know, so there's part of it, you know, when we talk about culture, um, that's a huge part of it too. So culture doesn't mean color. And a lot of times people get those two confused because everybody, no matter who they are on the face of the, of the earth, has culture, you know, there's a family culture, right? How you were raised and how you were brought up and your norms and things to things like that. You know, the, the shoulds that were put on to you, you know, all that kind of stuff, you know, everything else has 
the attachments to your parents. Just like I bring up my mother a lot, right? Um, and just you know, diff different things like that. It really shapes who we are as as people. We see a lot of that on the dance floor. You know, we see a lot of it um, when people don't make finals. Right. Their yeah. their ego is like, I was so good out there. What do you mean yeah. I didn't find them? Yeah. What's wrong with me? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, mm. inner critic. Yeah. You should have done. Should have done that. Oh, I know. Whenever I see a video of myself dancing, I'm like. Oh. Mm-hmm. You know, it was really hard. Everybody does that. You know, it was really hard. I think Jordan Frisbee said that he had a problem with being pitch and toed, right? And so it's hard. It was hard for him to. I I would imagine to watch himself on on TV, a video when he's looking at his feet and he's like, ah, but there's so much, that's like 10%. There's another 90% of him that was doing really well. So we just have to correct that 10%, right? And not focus on the bad part um, and mm -hmm. make that part of our, you know, our um, damage to our ego. Cause that's just not, it's not the whole, it's not the whole story, you know? And a lot mm -hmm. of times people, struggle with that because they don't understand the whole story of their, you know, of who they are as a person, as, you know, as a dancer, you know, some people start early and early and they're really able to catch on really quick. And there are some people that take a little bit longer to do it, you know, that but would be me. <laughs> right. <laughs> it's yeah, tough. I, already, I had yeah. to become a teacher to become a better dancer. I had to teach so I could learn it even yeah. more. Uh -huh. It's it's kind of odd and uh, backwards, if you will. But sometimes yeah. I get compliments on my teaching because I've done everything wrong. It didn't mm. come naturally. Mm -hmm. So yeah. there there is a, an advantage. How do you how do you tame your inner critic? Do you still have your inner critic? Um, a lot of times I I can see it coming, but it's not as nearly as bad as what it used to be. You know, so a lot of my inner critic came from, you know, uh, not necessarily my dad, but part of it was the absent of him. And part of it was, you know, grandfather and stepdad and all these other folks, too. They had a lot of good, but there was a lot of not so great, you know, in, in, in child rearing. Right. So that's where a lot of that inner critic comes from. And then, you know, things like in, in school and all that kind of stuff. I remember a teacher said something to me, and I put this in the book, this happened to Malcolm X also, uh, and he was at the top of his class, but he wasn't, um, you know, he wasn't considered, you know, to be uh, smart enough in the teacher's eyes, even though he was at the top of his class. And so even though he was straight A student, that teacher said something to him that kind of shaped the way that he saw people early on, right? Mm. Uh, so with my inner critic, I had to work really hard at it to silence it. And then that's the trick is, is how do we silence the inner critic? And uh, part of it is doing the opposite of what it tells us to do, you know, tells, says about us, right? If it says you can't build that fence, you know, you want a, a nice redwood fence, you know, you're going to fail at it. The best thing to do is to try, instead of hiring somebody to go ahead and, and work on on, on, on the redwood fence because it's yours, you know, and if it turns out sloppy, then you can do it again. You know, it's not a big deal, you know, so there's different things that kind of silence it. And once you start to be successful at those things that, um, you know, that the inner critic tells you that you can't do, you know, or at least trying at it, try at it, um, then you, um, you'll find that that voice starts to, you know, silence. They don't find something else, find something different. You know, but you want to start to try to take away the power out of the inner critic. Um, and one uh, one native uh, chief said that uh, there was two two wolves inside of him, and he said there was a a black wolf and a white wolf, right? And the the white wolf was the one that gave him the you know the positive affirmations and things like that, and the black wolf was the one that was like more ferocious and and wasn't so helpful. And so one person asked asked him the question, uh, which of these wolves, you know, um, has the most power? And the chief, 
said to him, the one that I feed the most. Mm. Brilliant. <laughs> right. We can give a lot of power to the inner critic by what, how we feed it. You know, mm. so our job is to starve the inner critic. You know, so I think a lot of times that's that's the struggle that a lot of people, you know, the best of us, they struggle with that. Um, we see that's why we see a lot of people with low self-esteem. There's <clears throat> they don't have a definition of who they are. Right. You gave me three definitions. You said, Monty, you're this, this, and this. And I gave you some earlier on also. Right. Um, now, I can tell you all that all the great qualities about you, but how Jen describes herself and defines herself is that much more powerful because now when this when this when this interview is over, you know, and Renee, he's off doing his cartoon thing, you know, and then there's nobody else calling you on the phone. You're the one that's left with you. Right. And so that definition, right, that definition of who you are is going to feed that self-concept. You know, your self-concept is that definition, that self-confidence, you know, is going to feed off of that self-concept. And then uh, and then that's the part of our, our self-esteem and our, our that ego self. You know, so all those things kind of entail with the inner critic. And that's just one small portion of it. Oh, so much there. Wow. What a great book this is going to turn out to be. When is it released? Soon? Well, it's with Balboa Press right now. And so we're working on uh, copyright. He's, they're going through it and they um, I, I have to uh, make sure there's no copyright issues. So they found a few of them. Um, so that's been corrected. And I had to do a, a notary uh, from some of the stories that I used um, from a client. And so that's been done. And so now it has to go back to the editors so that they can edit it. Um, so I'm guessing uh, probably like the end of the summer, maybe the beginning of fall, somewhere around there. Good for you. And then yeah. you're gonna need like 12 weeks to market the crap out of it before it comes out. Right, yeah, so there's like, there's a lot of work that goes into it. My hat's off to a lot of people who are, who are book writers like yourself and you know, it's it's not the easiest thing in the world. It's it's really difficult, but once it's done, it's like getting your degree or something like that. It's accomplishment. But, but is this your first book? Yeah. Okay, it'll get easier with the second one. Okay. Yeah, because you're right. The first one, you're like, oh, this is a Herculean task. Mm-hmm. And then once you've done that, then the second one's like, hey, and then then like. Yeah. I'm starting my third one. Are and you really? Funny thing, I'm, um, I've known that I want to write it for a while. I'm going to call it Give to Get. It's going to be a, a discussion on um, relationship marketing. Oh, awesome. And But I decided I'm going to go ahead first and teach a class on it. And then oh. it'll become Because I've, I've been wanting to write this thing forever because I get to talk with so many business owners who mm -hmm. demonstrate to me what it is that they do to give and then the reciprocity and the loyalty of their clients, right? So that I've got so many stories of them in my head that I just have to like go into all my documentation and pull it out and start, you know, like, but, but then COVID-19 came along. Yeah. And now I'm applying this philosophy, this philosophy to my own client base. Like, okay, we're all in this together. Here's what mm -hmm. I'm going to give to you guys to get you through this because we're we're in this together. It's a team. Sure. Mm -hmm. So I think I think what the universe was telling me is that I needed to wait until this moment to live it, not just observe it in others, but to live it. Yeah. And teach a class on it. And then even when I teach the class, I know I'm going to continue to like get new information because we're going to share. Sure. Everyone's going to... And so, yeah. So who knows when I, when I finally get this thing in print, it'll be like, Oh yeah, whipped out another book. <laughs> <laughs> but you're right. Like it's that first time you're like, dang, that was hard. Same thing with online courses. Uh -huh. I built my very first online course that still is not um, seen the light of day. Uh, in 2018, mm -hmm. and then I decided to take my other two courses that I am actively teaching and put those into online courses. 
And who knew, Monty, that like all that work that I was doing would prepare me perfectly for COVID. Boom. Like people wow. can just sign up for it. Like mm -hmm. I like the fear of dealing with uh, software editing and videos and getting in front of the camera and lighting systems and there's a lot and I'm yeah. definitely not perfect on it, but at mm. least I'm not scared about it anymore. Sure. Sure. Yeah. Yeah, now was that, that, that was the thing that we were talking about in Maui, wasn't it? I think we were talking about some of those online courses, if I remember correctly, that you were doing. You had some other things going on also. Oh, I'm just always creating. You know, since me and Renee, we're always creating something. And I find mm -hmm. that in the most trying of times is when I'm the most creative. Really? Mm -hmm. Yeah, what a powerful trait. Yeah. It, it it's kind of neat. Like I I don't I don't plan it, but like um, I don't know, and I don't even know where it comes from. I feel like mm -hmm. sometimes I'm just a vessel, and I just I just share, you know. Yeah. Um, and and you know also too, we're just we're all, I don't know. I think I think the challenge is is that I observe what's around me, and I'm just like that let's talk about that and people are like oh my god let's talk about that it's like nothing that nothing original it's just that like you know i'll zero in on a concept like for example uh i saw a coach that i know have mm -hmm. something on one of his pieces of paper that said marketing is an attitude not a department and it credited emith so emith okay great so when i got into a conference later on that day and I have the ability to speak. I'm like, guys and gals, I've got something for you to write down. Write this down, type it down. Marketing mm -hmm. is an attitude. It is not a department. And I wow. got that from, and then everyone's like, wow. And now it's really funny because now I've got like, people sending me, sending me things like, marketing is an attitude, not a department. We love that. And it's like, okay, let me give credit to like email that came yeah. from email. Mm -hmm. But, what was so fun is that um, last night I was on the phone with a new client. She does um, financial planning and she helps coach people about how to improve their credit ratings and she helps them build a plan around their financial dreams, right? It's not yeah. just it's not just selling them stocks. It's like, okay, yeah. let's talk about money and get, get our heads and our health and our inner credit wrapped sure. around, it, right? Mm -hmm. And then, so I told her my little phrase and then she's like, oh, that's a great phrase. I need to come up with something. So I said, okay, here's your phrase. Financial abundance is an attitude. It is not a lottery ticket. And she goes, oh, genius. I'm like, okay, I'll write that down for you and you're welcome. <laughs> but, <laughs> but it's just a matter of just observing and then saying like, okay, well, if, it sh if this shoe fits, what about this shoe? Mm -hmm. But we all have our things. I mean, I don't think that what I do is remarkable but i have a lot of fun with it yeah and here you are i'm looking at you with all like oh my gosh he's so amazing and you're like yeah jen this is just my normal day whatever <laughs> yeah and now let's talk about the people that you serve like okay, okay you're 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 doing so many things who <laughs> and there are people that you serve in your life you know you've got a whole bunch of them so walk us through who you serve? Oh boy. Um, so under the uh, banner of marriage and family therapy, I'm able to serve uh, couples, marriage couples, um, individuals, adults, elderly, um, kids. So Every, everyone, er, I'm able to serve just about everybody. So there's nobody that's kind of excluded from under the banner of marriage family therapy. So uh, my, my um, space is, is pretty broad. And I think uh, part of it is, and also, so what, is, what they require is that you get your CEUs, your continuing education units. And that's, uh, you know, so that you can be able to stay abreast on all of the different um, populations, you know, as far as culture, you know, um, dual relationships, all those different types of things, law and ethics and, and families and all that kind of stuff. They want you to, you know, to stay, stay current and all of it. Um, 
So different types of relationships, you know, it's important to, for me to, you know, to be a part of that too, you know, so, and then another one is the counter transference, you know, there's different things that may be brought up in the therapy session that um, may trigger something in the therapist. So, so that part of that, those things is all part of what they want you to get trained on, you know, so that you can, so that, you know, one can be um, prepared to, to handle the, the, the world that we live in. You know, different people. Yeah. And then, uh, then you also serve your family, right? Yep, yep. So I got my my three sisters and my mother, and my sisters. She has a set of twins, and then my younger sister. She has a uh, eighteen year old girl, and then I have my thirteen year old daughter. That's right. I forgot that you're a daddy. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So where's she? Where's your daughter? She lives with her mother in, in Vegas. Oh, and so I okay. talked to her. Yeah, I talked to her just about every day. She sent me a text message today. But we, we normally talk uh, every day. And then um, we watch YouTube stuff together. You know, so she, we're really into like the pranks, bathroom pranks and stuff like that. And so she's like super funny, really, really smart girl, you know. Uh-huh. Yeah, she was like that when she was a kid. She'd say, hey, "Daddy, tell me a funny joke," you know, and then she would tell this the corniest jokes ever, and she would think it's the funniest thing in the world, you know, and wouldn't even make any sense, but she thought it was great, you know. So she carried that up until what she is doing now. But super, really smart, really funny person, and and we will talk on the phone for like three, four hours just watching stuff. So. Aww. So even though she's physically not near you, you're just as close as ever. Yeah, you know, when uh, her and my mother, her and her mother split up, or her and I split up, uh, one of the things that I really valued was coming home from work, and then I have to, you know, marry him. She was just like a little thing like this. And I remember uh, that was like the best part of the day, you know, walking in the door, picking her up, and then um, I would watch a uh, World Series of Poker, and I used to have her like right here, you know, and then turn the turn the TV. So that was part of it. And so, you know, brush your hair and everything like that. So yeah, we're, we're super close. And that just, you know, that bond has never really left, you know, even though it didn't work out between myself and her mother. That's okay. Though. That's yeah. okay. It's just the way things are, right? And you know, because, because you are a licensed marriage and family therapist, that must've been a really interesting journey for you because you're, you're an expert in it. But you're also going through some stuff. Yeah, I wasn't a therapist at the time, but I was uh, working for Behavior Health, and um, boy, that was it was the toughest thing ever, you know, because like people see you where you are now, but they don't know. A lot of people don't know the story, the journey that right. comes with it. Just out of curiosity, when you were going through your divorce, was that about the same time you discovered dance in 2008? No, uh, that was early, early on. Um, this is when I, I had a conflict with my church, you know, that was going on with me personally. And so mm-hmm. after that, I was like so despondent. And um, then that's when Dan, dance picked me up after that. You know, so and it wasn't that my, you know, the faith in God has changed. It's evolved. It's different. Um, it's just my thoughts about the organized church was is a little bit different now. Not that I don't have faith in it, but um, it just kind of just changed the way I thought of, thought about, um, you know, the, the whole structure of church. And even though I think it's a great thing, there are just certain things about it that kind of threw me off. And it was just my experience from that. And so it's been really, that was a tough one. That was really tough. You know. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That is a big that is a big piece of a lot of folks' lives, and uh, you know it's it's interesting. I don't talk about church much. I love I love studying different religions. I actually mm-hmm. love going to different churches, and I mm-hmm. love seeing how different cultures have their different rules and stuff. But I I I have a really hard time claiming a religion as my own. Mm-hmm. I guess Christian would be the closest, but like I just am so fascinated by how how much is wrapped around um, different faiths 
and mm -hmm. how because maybe I'm just lucky that like my grandfather was Baptist, my grandmother is Methodist, my mom was Methodist, she converted Catholic, my dad was Catholic. Um, I've got Jewish cousins. Like we have so much diversity, religious religion wise, in my family that it's like there was never any like this is the only one and you must do this. Well, you know, okay, go worship. Yay. Yeah. Yeah, sure. Yeah. I think my experience is more like uh, what Christ had. He had a problem with some of the organized church systems also, you know, because they were they had the letter of the law, but they weren't they didn't have the spirit of the law. And then that's that's one of the things that why they crucified him, you know, because he did things on the Sabbath when he wasn't supposed to, you know, but here it is. People are hurting on this day and they didn't quite he did, they didn't understand can see it. You know, and this is the thing that. God was showing, you know, the people, uh, the the intent of the law, you know. So, you know, and he had his experience with some really hard folks, you know. And uh, part of one of the things that he said was to the scribes and Sadducees, you know, those people who was uh, doctors in the law and everything, because they kept testing him. He says, you know, you, you know, you guys are almost, you guys are quite like those, or a little bit like those. Uh, those uh, graves out there, you know, they're beautiful and white on the outside, but inside they're full of excess and dead man's bones, you know. So he saw the inside of people there have all this really, you know, the robes and everything else, but the hypocrisy was keeping them away from the real act of God. Mm. You know, so, that, so that's the thing that I kind of see. And, and so it was really encouraging when I started to look back on the experience of Christ, you know, and when he looked at people, he loved them, you know, and he was so down to earth. He wasn't so far off, you know, and so that's what I really can value. So my relationship with God has not changed in that aspect, but the other stuff is just really hard for me to digest because I see it being so far from, you know, the intent of God. That's kind of where I came come from on that end. That's amazing. Oh, my gosh. That is so uh. I love these conversations with you, man. I could talk to you for hours. Really, it's you're right. There is there is a lot, it, and it's it's interesting too because there is faith, and then there's monetization. Mm. And when you look at it, churches are businesses. Yeah. Well, you know, it just be it becomes a problem when I start seeing uh, ATMs in the church and things like that. You know, I grew up in a church and I am part of it, but man, it's just hard for me to see it. And that's what was, you know, when Christ was dealing with that stuff, there were money changers in the church or in the synagogue. Yes. And he, that's in the Bible right there. And he says, right. And he says, uh, it is written that this, you know, this should be called the house of prayer. You made it into a. Uh, I think call it a den of thieves. I can't remember exactly word for word what he said, but then he turned over the money changers and the tables and he was angry and he took a score to start whipping people off the church. It was that righteous anger that he had because it was so far off, you know, mm. he turned, they turned it into something that it wasn't God, you know, and there are right. people that are dying here right next to the church. And then there they are. So, I see it different. I see it different, like how he he sees it. I love your perspective, man. That is really, really cool. Mm. And and you're right. It's like, yeah, you grew up with this, so I'm sure that you have a a standard because it's it's coming from both sides of the family. Mm -hmm. having, having yeah. 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 Sure. You know, it's the gospel. When you look at it, it's not. It's not what. You know, it's it's a thing that's pure. You know, it, that it's uh it's supposed to be pure, but when we start when when it starts to become something that is like uh, monetized, and I'm not saying that pastors shouldn't get a a, a salary, you know, or, or things like that. You know, that that's fine. You know, because they, you know, they should have uh, their their needs met and everything, and live a really good life and retirement all taken care of because it's a very very difficult job pastoring. All people, I don't know how a lot of people do it, you know, because a lot of people don't go come to a person like myself because they're sometimes they're afraid or whatever. They'll go to a pastor who they're familiar with, right. you know, so 
um, when I spoke at my uncle's church and I was helping him out, you know, one morning it would be eight, you know, three, four hundred people, you know, that I'm speaking in front of and, and they're all coming from poverty and things like that. And so that's those are the, the people that they trust because they don't trust the government. They don't trust mm -hmm. other outsiders. Right. right? So a pastor, right. I believe, you know, there are really good hearted people out there that deserve to be taken care of the family, you know, all those different types of things. The problem comes, right? The problem comes when we start seeing, um, God, I can't, I don't know if I can, I mean, if they have their own business, it's one thing, but taking money, you know, taking money and then buying Rolls Royces and, you know, all this kind of ridiculous stuff that just, to me, it's just really off-putting. And I think they're, and then they're using the gospel, you know, pimping the gospel, if you will, to to get more, you know. So anyway, I, I don't know how I got off on that track, but I, my no, whole. I, I, I don't mean to make you uncomfortable. I'm loving where you're going, but no, I, yeah. I get it. I get it, and I understand it. And you're right. There's there are certain limits, you know. It. Renee and I have these conversations. You know, artists, artists create and they create and they create, and and some people are like, oh, that's nice. Can I take a picture of it? Now, how about you pay me for it? Yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah. Because yeah. we, all, we all have a and, and, and dancers. Look at all the dancers who we have admired over the years who can't teach right now, who can't go out and compete and earn a living. And it's such entertainment for us and we love them, but it's like, yeah, maybe it's time that they go get a secondary income because yeah. Yeah. in the time of COVID, dancing is kind of Yeah. Uh, off the table so it's it's fascinating how we are all gifted with certain things mm -hmm. it could be a pastor it could be an artist a bassist a, a therapist a marketer a writer you know mm -hmm. and and what what is the value of each well they're all valuable that's the thing sure. that's what our culture and our 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 planet so beautiful is we all have mm -hmm. something to create i can't hunt I can't fish. If it right. weren't for the people who were, uh, you know, cultivating the foods, so I'd be dead. Yeah. I, I could barely cook, Monty. You don't want to eat chase my cooking. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. I mean, I'm a subsistence cook, right? <laughs> All right? That's fair enough. Yeah, but but man, come to think of it, okay, did I, I used to belong to the um, the gospel choir here in Monterey? Mm -hmm. It was a fantastic group of people. Um, and uh, that was when I started going to um, some of the churches that just have the most amazing food. Oh my gosh, mm. I just love, I loved being part of the gospel choir. Sure. <laughs> Such great music. And then the food, oh, the food. They had me at the chicken and the peach cobbler. <laughs> oh gosh, yeah, I, yeah. You know, the yes. fellowship goes into a church. Yeah. Oh, for dinner. Like it. Oh. Nothing like it. It's nothing like it. Yeah. Dang. Yeah. Yeah. In my next life, I'm gonna have to come back, you know, sitting down at the knee of some really amazing cook because I uh -huh. we're talented in our family, but cooking's not our thing. <laughs> yeah, no, I hear you. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Are you a good cook? You know, um, I am. I really like to cook. Um I just bought a I bought a uh, gas grill, I, but my mother she had a barbecue business. Um, yeah, no wonder she, what you're saying. yeah, yeah. She um, she had a barbecue business, and uh, man, it was just great. And so I learned a whole lot. Now it's passed down from from my uh, grandmother and my grandfather to her. You know, they took that from Texas, and she learned it from my my grandmother was the best, great cook. Before mm -hmm. she passed, she she uh, passed down to my mother and then my mother passed it down to me. And then I have the barbecue pit that my grandfather built, you know, for them, you know, for Aww. that. So, yeah. So I do, I like to cook a lot, you know, it's just really, it's really good. I'm now I'm just trying to work really hard in eating right right now. So that's been a big thing. And so I'm working on my girlish figure right now. So, <laughs> so no people. Work it. Work it. <laughs> I'm working it. What's, What's your like, favorite? food lately um 
I'll tell you before it was a German chocolate cake on Christmas. Oh, good Lord. That I and love German chocolate cake. German chocolate cake. Mm. Yeah. But now, now that it's not Christmas and you're watching your girlish figure. Uh, I salad. eat boring salad, boring salad and chicken, boring, but lean meat, boring. <laughs> it's not fun. It's not comfort food at all. It's just boring. I try to make it fun, but there's only so much fun you can get out of that. Come on, you know. <laughs> Renee makes all his food fun with tapatio sauce. That's his thing. Renee, oh, I didn't know that. He likes oh, tapatio. Yeah. He'll, he'll throw tapatio on anything, and it'll make yeah. it. It'll make cardboard taste good. Yeah. <laughs> I can't touch it. I can't handle it. But he's just all you. <laughs> tapatio. <laughs> I have to give him a Tapatio shirt or something like that. Hey, <laughs> That's too funny. Yeah. Wow. Spam. You and spam. Oh, spam. <laughs> wow. You know, it's, it's such a perfect blend of the Filipino and the Latino cultures. It's like, oh, yeah. You know, yeah. He's been on a thing about tacos lately. So, like, we've been doing tacos and, yeah, yeah. Tonight we're so probably going to have guacamole and salsa and chips that's probably like our snack tonight awesome yeah he's a cook uh, he's better than i am let's yeah. just put it this if it doesn't come in a pre-packaged form mm -hmm. uh, we ain't eat it so it's it's all coming out of a jar or um something i'll tell you what <laughs> i'll tell you what jen i'm gonna i'm gonna do you a favor because that you know that that we can't have that we can't have that, Jen. Come on. <laughs> when you, when you, when you and Renee invite me over, <laughs> I'm gonna, I'm gonna give you five good dishes. Okay. Easy, right? Easy. One pot. Sorry. I only want to do one pot or pan. That's it. One. This is a challenge, boy. Good lord. <laughs> All right. Do you want to know how we were eating pre-COVID days? All right. There's a ton of restaurants out here. Oh, my gosh. Every single meal. Well, okay, maybe maybe we'd have breakfast here, you know, but yeah. pretty much every meal. So I got to confess. All right. All right, Father, forgive me for I have <laughs> sinned. <laughs> so easily, easily, our, our uh, food budget each month was somewhere close to, like, I don't know, twelve hundred to fifteen hundred. Because it's going out, and it's and I'm. I'd rather I'd rather when you work from home and you're home all the time. I want to get out. I want to socialize. I want to. I want to yeah. eat somebody else yeah. cooking. I love. Yeah. I love eating food from around the world. Yeah. I don't have fire or the spices or the time to learn how to cook all the foods that I love eating. I don't. Okay. I'm not going to go out and get a whole thing so I can have my own sushi. I'm not going to go out and, 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 you know, get enough uh, spices and, and stuff to make my own Thai dishes. Right. In, just Indian dishes take all day to cook. Right. Yeah. Like all the international foods that I love. Mm -hmm. Plus, you know, the midnight trips over to McDonald's because you got to have French fries. <laughs> <and all. laughs> well, now that we're in the time of COVID and Renee uh -huh. and I are in a lot. I mean, we've gone out a few times, but nothing yeah. like so, so our budget for food has dropped like crazy. Mm -hmm. And I did the math for the month of April. We averaged eating; it, it cost us twenty two dollars per day. My so we goodness! Went, yeah, so we went from because I'm like looking at all my pennies, right? Let's see, mm -hmm. what is that? What is the tally for that? Twenty two dollars per day times thirty, six hundred sixty bucks. Hey, that's that's like we've cut our we've cut our um, expenditure expenses in half. Wow, that's so a lot. If we, yeah, it's a lot of money. But if we here's the thing, here's how I've been operating again pre-COVID. Uh -huh. I'm a crappy cook, but when I get invited over to people's houses for dinner, guess what I like to do? What's that? I love doing dishes. Do you really? So I'll clean. And then they cook for me. And so I don't have to worry about cooking. I just eat and then I clean up and they love it. 
You are sneaky. Come on. <laughs> Do you want to invite us over to your house, baby? I'll clean Absolutely. your dish. Absolutely. That'll be a treat in itself. <laughs> you have did to tell I, me twice. <laughs> did I ever tell you how um okay, so so because you've been there with, with us and now okay, so the very first time we were invited over to Jolene's house. Uh huh. Right? Very first time, years ago. And uh, you know, she's she's trying to organize she's an amazing hostess, as you know. Yeah, yeah. She really is. Off the chain, like yeah. oh my god. I wanna be Jolene when I grow up. Yeah, shout out to Jolene. Love Jolene, Trent Holm. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, uh, she uh she's got this beautiful home and she was getting us ready for like, you know, a, a dance party. And I can see that she is struggling with, you know, making all the arrangements, being the hostess with the most is cleaning up the house. Mm -hmm. And I and I looked at her and I said, Jolene, do you know that I have a superpower that you may not know of? And she goes, what? I said, I love to clean. She goes, really? And you know how you could, I'm going to do my best impression. Really? Yeah, that's pretty good. That's pretty good. Her eyes got this eyes, big. Yeah, yeah. And I said, would you like me to clean your house before the party? She goes, oh, wow. I cleaned that thing. The problem was, is I had to be like, figure out where everything went. So I'm like, okay, where's right. the network? I was like, I was like a bulldozer. I come through that whole kitchen because you know how that that big old counter can accumulate a lot yeah, of stuff. It can, yeah. I, I had that thing cleaned. I had the whole the whole kitchen living room was done, and then it that, was funny. My goodness. He invited me back, of course. I always get invited back because she knows that I clean. <laughs> yeah. He goes, what am I going to do six months from now? It's not going to be clean anymore. I'm like, invite me back. She's like, okay. <laughs> oh, my goodness. That's so cute. <laughs> so you cook, baby. I'll come over. <laughs> Boom. It's done. You don't have to tell me twice. I'm serious. <laughs> I'm oh, serious. That is so funny. Okay. Okay. So, my darling, what is your why? Why do you do what you do? Well, it's part of like the same thing that we've been talking about. I think my why is, um, it almost comes from a because. Uh, you know, it's the thing, it's like, uh, it's part of it is the purpose, you know, I, I believe in that purpose and a calling, <laughs> you know, something that is beyond us, that kind of just draws us, you know, and it's it, to me, it's un unescapable. So I couldn't escape this path that I'm on. You know, it's just something that was there, you know, and it has to be, has to be. That means that through the ups and downs of life and, you know, going through all the, you know, the relationships and the learning and all that kind of stuff, you know, it brought me to this point here, you know, so. And the part of all that that I went through and the things that I've ex learned and, you know, is, is there to help other people, you know, because I've used that as the fuel to help other folks. So I believe the why is um, is more fueled and, and driven by purpose and if you want to call it destiny and all those different types of things. So those are the things that I, I kind of believe in the most. And a lot of times, you know, it's not pop psychology to me. I think this is something that is kind of beyond what we can, you know, see with our own eyes or kind of feel. It's one of those things. And you know when it's there. You know, you know it when it's there and when you're not in it, you do feel it, you know, it causes stress and anxiety and everything else. You know, I like doing this stuff with people I love. I love being here to talk with you. You know, uh, I don't like being controlled and I have to do this or I have to do that. This is the freedom that I have. So I guess part of the why th that I do things I'm doing is, you know, is I, I would say that it's just purpose driven. It's destiny is a it's a calling it's a drive you know it's those things that um that's kind of beyond who i am as a person you know so that's that's drawn me to to this this path that i'm on you're amazing truly <laughs> what do you think you're going to be doing for the next, the next five years on this path 
uh, the next five years, um, I'm already, I already feel like I'm retired, you know? So retirement to me, this is, this is retirement. You know, it's just like I retired at an early age doing the things that I love the most, you know? Mm -hmm. So I'm doing, uh, right now, you know, I have real estate going, I'm, I want to start buying more real estate. Um, that's a challenge, you know, that I really, I've always been into that when I was a kid, you know? So <clears throat> I want to do that. I want to go back to Mafangano Island. I would like to uh, uh, do a little library for the kids there, you know, um, like a little computer lab and things like that, because they don't have that there. You know, something on that order where they can they can go there and they can have all the books and, and everything that they need, you know, something like that. Um, so those are in, that's probably not in the next five years, maybe a little bit beyond five years, but within a five year period, you know, it's going to be the real estate thing, continue to build, you know, do another book, build this therapy, be the best therapist I can be, you know, start studying a little bit more, you know, bringing out more of my qualities and traits and things like that, sharpening my tools to, you know, so I can be able to uh, deliver myself to a broader, broader audience. Cause right now a lot of people don't know that I'm there, you know, so it's part of me getting out there a little bit more and so that people know that I'm, I'm here, you know, so, so that's, those are, those are some of the things that I'm thinking about in the next five years. Oh, I'm so proud of you. And yes, you are here. You are real and you're amazing and you're right. More people need to know who you are. Mm -hmm. Auntie Jamari, my man. Yeah. <laughs> I like the way you say that. <laughs> no, I mean, it's, it's so true. Another thing that I absolutely love about our dance community is we know each other as dancers first. Mm -hmm. And then we're lucky enough to break bread together yep. or to have some quality time together and like actually mm -hmm. like figure out what we actually do. Mm -hmm. But I love how we don't come into dance saying, so who are you? How much do you make? Oh, yeah. Like, you know, it's, mm -hmm. we, we just come in as dancers. There's, there right. is really... Like the, the only way that we really know each other is, do I feel great dancing with this individual on the sure. dance floor? Yeah. Neck. Yes. Okay, great. Next. What's your name again? You know? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. It is it's a rare place where we, um, we just, uh, it's just a different way of meeting each other. It and really I, is. I have mind being asked, so what is it that you do? But like, yeah, like dance, we just, oh, you know how to do our dance? Okay, great, let's dance. And then right. and then it's so backwards, isn't it? It really is, yeah. <laughs> That's what's unique about West Coast Swing community. Gosh, you know, met so many great people from around the world, you know, from around the world that I would not have gotten a chance to meet if it had not been for dance. And right. different backgrounds and, you know, different talents and all kinds of really cool stuff. Yeah. Yeah. And, and it is really amazing to find out how many people in our community are just complete badasses. Oh and my God. Know, right. We don't know. Like, yeah. Discovered, I'm sure you have too. I mean, gosh, Michelle Beltran, she's amazing. Yeah. Um, and she, and she's a lot of part of my reason why I'm doing the book thing, yes. you know, because she's, she's been me out. Oh my, yeah. Big time. Yeah. She's a beautiful human being, just she a wonderful, wonderful soul. And mm -hmm. like down here in Monterey, you know, like we'll attract all kinds of people to dance. Mm -hmm. And it turns out that they are <coughs> successful attorneys or investors or entrepreneurs or artists or military people or teachers. Like, they're just enormously talented in what they do, and we don't know it until we break bread with them. And it's like, oh, really? Yeah. You invented something, or you are like the guy that is responsible. Like, it's amazing, but it's fun. Yeah. It's the, the most backdoor version of getting to know people, and I prefer it, quite frankly. <laughs> I do too. Yeah, it's it's a lot easier. It's a real, it's a lot easier for myself. You know, I think, uh, isn't it? I think so. I really yeah. do. It's a great way to meet somebody. I mean, 
I don't know how many couples have gotten together because the dance is just astronomical, yeah. but yeah. Yeah. yeah, we dance. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then also too, like, okay, don't you love how we have such a diverse group of people in our dance world? Yeah. Yeah. Black, Asian, Indian, uh, all different countries. Mm -hmm. Uh, uh, wouldn't it be fair to say that every continent, with the exception of Antarctica, is represented in our dance? I would think so. Yeah. 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 Russian, Singapore, Australian, right? All over Europe. Mm -hmm. South America, we've got the Brazilians. Brazilians, yeah. <laughs> Gosh. Diego uh, and uh, Diego and Jessica, they were really encouraging when I first started too. Uh, I, still, so I still have a picture of them uh, on my phone when they they were both giving me a kiss on this side when I was just starting off. Really sweet, yeah, yeah. Uh, I could watch them all day. I could totally, yeah, I could watch. Them. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I think I think that's part of the. I think when I look at it because I don't have like one group of friends that looks a certain way. Right. I love diversity mm -hmm. and I think it really has a lot to do with our dancing. I really yeah. do. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. I can't really think of, um, I don't know. I don't know if any other dances this time. I don't know. Maybe there, there is, you know, but, um, this diverse. You're right. Like what other dances are this diverse? Probably not. Time to think of it. I don't think so. I don't think there is one. Well, ballroom. Okay, ballroom is pretty darn diverse. Uh, the there's not a whole lot of black folks at ballroom. Maybe there is, but I haven't seen them. Oh, you're right. Okay, you're right. Yeah, you're right. I see a lot of black folks in other dance forms. Yeah, Hawaiians. I haven't seen them in ballroom too much. Oh, you're right. And we've got a lot of Hawaiians in our culture, in our yep. dance. West thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you're right. We've got a whole bunch of Polynesian, don't we? We do. Yeah. Huh. I guess you're, oh, wow. That is the superhero uh, secret power of West Coast Swing, isn't it? Diversity. Diversity, yeah. Yeah. And then we're, we almost have to dance with everybody. <laughs> you have to dance with everybody from different walks of life, you know, and it's just it's pretty incredible because each continent. Uh, there's a there's a certain baseline to West Coast Swing that feels really good. But as a leader in, in the follows, there's a certain type of like uh, I could tell the difference between different continents, you know, from how they dance. I never thought about that. Ooh, tell me. OK, what do you feel? Uh. So there's a certain gooeyness that's there with all, you know, when, when they, when at the most advanced dancers, you know, they have that stretchy feel. Uh, but people from Singapore, the falls from Singapore feel a lot different than um, folks from like Russia, you know. Wow. Yeah. And it's, I don't know what, I think it's part of the, how they interpret movement and things like that. It's, it's just a lot different. You know, and it's not, really it's not one that's better than another. It's just, the, it's just a different type of feel. Well, isn't it cute? Like Fresno, when all the Koreans come over for um, South Bay Dance Fling and yeah. they come all the way from Korea and they do their cute little line dancing. Mm. That's yeah. adorable. It's so adorable. <laughs> like so yeah. disappointing to come all the way over to do a little dance and be part of a community. That is dedicated. Great. They're, they're very dedicated. And, uh, they feel, I mean, they're just great dancers, you know? So, um, yeah, yeah, they're, they're really, they're pretty incredible. Um, folks from Australia are really awesome. You know, they feel different. Oh yeah. Oh, yeah. And um, did you see that uh, Melina Ramirez Stewart's kid and, and, and um, Scott, they, they uh, went viral recently on TikTok. 
Oh, no, I haven't seen it. You haven't? No. No? Uh -uh. Okay. So what's really cute, you should go look this up. This is, this is again, how I love how our community embraces diversity. Uh -huh. So apparently, their little boy, I can't remember the little boy's name, but he likes to wear dresses. And that's okay with mom and dad. Mm -hmm. And there's a TikTok video that Scott did mm -hmm. that said, my son wanted to go to the theater in his Elsa dress from mm -hmm. Frozen. And Scott's like, mm, I don't know. I don't think you should do it alone. And then there is a video of Scott dressing up in his adult Elsa costume with their mm -hmm. little boy in his mm -hmm. junior Elsa costume going to the theater together. Is huh. that adorable or what? Yeah, that's pretty cute. Yeah. Yeah. And then there's other cute little videos about Scott dancing with their son and mm. they're wearing their dresses. Like it's so great to see such good parenting. Mm -hmm. How it's like, yes, son, I, I love you. I support you. I mean, that is wonderful. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, I've and so, yeah. <laughs> It's it's neat seeing that kind of support, and so yeah, we have we have gay, we have um, we have people who are trans. I remembered. Oh, I don't know if you've ever met Kimmy. No, it's Timmy actually. Timmy. Um, Timmy is a um, uh, he he wears dresses and he loves Hello Kitty and he loves to be a follow. Mm -hmm. And I met him in uh, Redwood City, in the Bay Area, mm -hmm. and I was like. Oh, do you want to dance? And he was so happy that I asked him how to. I asked him to dance, and yeah. um, I didn't. I, I'm just dancing with everybody. I don't think anything of it. It's like, okay, yeah. it's another person to dance with. No judgment. I don't care. Right. And uh, at the end of the dance, he came. We were leaving, and he came running after me. He said, "Thank you for dancing. Nobody else was dancing with me, and I really appreciate it." Oh, yeah. So, that I made a difference. But guess sure. what? Every time I see Timmy. I go ask Timmy to dance. Yeah. Well, you ask everybody to dance. That's like your thing, right? That and smoking. Then you're in the smoke. <laughs> That's your thing, too. That's your thing, yeah. too. I want to make sure that everybody who comes to that dance feels like they were seen. Yeah. I see, right? Sure. Like you were saying, yeah. I see. Yeah. And then I want everyone to have a good time. Yeah. Because when you see all these people sitting down, waiting for someone to ask them. Right, right. Yeah, you know, I think that's one of the things that, you know, my mentor is John Piper when I first started and still is to this day, but Love yeah, I, yeah, he's known for dancing with everybody and, um, you know, bringing that spirit to the dance floor. And so that's kind of the thing that him and I really have in common is that, that thing of acceptance. You know, I did feel bad a couple of times, you know, I, when I'm dancing on the floor, and if I get if I'm in the middle of the floor, I think I'm gonna get caught by you know different follows, right? Trying to, and I'm trying to get off the floor to get some water or something like that, and it's um, it's tough for me to say no, but I'm gonna come back. Let, let's get the next song or something like that, you know, because I was used to just going back to back, you know, all the time when I was first starting off and started getting really good and you know that I can keep the beat and all that kind of stuff. So, but then I learned that if I'm going to have like longevity, then I have to kind of, you know, see about myself too. And at the same time, be mindful of the person that I have to go back to, you know, so that way that they know that I didn't forget about them, you know, so that's pretty important. That's another tool um, when it comes to uh, social dancing with everybody and making them feel welcome and accepted. So important. Yeah. Okay. Here's a fun thing. So Renee and I decided to go into the garage and do four dances. I needed to get a drink of water between every single dance because I was so out of shape. Yeah. <laughs> I think oh, it's wait. probably. <laughs> Renee, I'm so thirsty. Hold on. Hold on. <laughs> oh my god. Oh my god. I'm so tired. That was exactly what happened. Yeah, it's probably those McDonald's, McDonald's fries that you're eating. What what was that? That's I said it was probably those McDonald's fries that you like to eat late night. <laughs> no, I'm so, just out of shape. 
Are you yeah. are you still dancing in the time of COVID? Um, you know, just doing a little bit here and there. I'm just trying to practice at home, uh, doing a lot of music and a lot of visualization of myself on the dance floor and like who I'm dancing with and the type of song that I'm dancing with, you know, with them with and, uh, you know, just different things like that. So I'm trying my best to try to stay as active as I can. Most of it is just listening to music and, and sometimes I'll do, you know, different types of dance stuff here at the house. Well, I applaud that because um, my butt is in this chair a lot. And even though Renee and I are together, we're not mm. focusing on dance right now. Yeah. We're focusing on getting work done. But but mm -hmm. in the occasional, it's true. It's like, I think I figured it out what makes me dance. It's the good music. Yeah. Because I'll hear a song. I'll be like, whoo, want to dance? And we'll just yeah. dance away for like maybe like, I don't know, 16 beats. And then we'll be like, okay, back to work. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, he's such a great dancer. I really love Renee. Yeah. Yeah, great dancer. He's good. Yeah. My gosh, I can talk with you all day. I, you know what maybe we should do is we should schedule another one of these just so we can keep talking. I love it. Let's do it. Do you have any advice for our wonderful listeners, whoever the heck is going to be watching this? It could, this could uh, be get like one thumb up. I have no idea, but for those. 10 people that might be listening. <laughs> um, let's see. Advice. I think part of it is uh, take the opportunity, uh, you know, to uh, think about all the people that you love and you care about, you know, um, be a good idea to call them up on the phone and, and talk to them. You know, sometimes they're, might be a broken relationship or, you know, somebody that you haven't, you know, talked to in a long time and, you know, you've been putting it off, you know, it probably is a good time right now to start to mend those relationships and, you know, try to make good with those things, you know, so uh, that's, that, that, that would be one of it. Cause life, you know, it's, uh, it's one of those things where we wish we had more of it when we don't have enough. Right. So, Amen. So I, that that'll be one of one of the things I would say. You know, live your life abundantly. You know, uh, do the things that really make you happy. Uh, don't let fear uh, take, you know, deter you away from your your path and your story. You know, that critic. You know, don't let the critic talk you out of doing things that you, you know, otherwise would do or you have a desire to do. You know, stick with the thing that you really love, and you know, you know what's in your heart. You don't have to have people to tell you. Right. So that's the one of the big pieces that I'm, you know, that I would want to leave with the audience, too. Um, and even those little things can be, you know, you could talk about those ones for hours. But, yeah, those are some those are some of the things that I would I would. Want. Oh, live. Be honest, too. And that's what Shakespeare said. Right. To thy own self be true. Mm. Hamlet. Yeah. To thy own self be true. Wow. Wow. Right? Because you have to live with yourself. And if you aren't true to yourself, that inner critic. Oh, it's the worst. Like most people can't look in the mirror. They can't. It's hard. It's hard. It's hard, hard, hard. You know, but when you're when you're dishonest with yourself. You know, so, um, it's a lot easier to be honest and just to, you know, to not not harm people and, and do the right thing. It's a lot easier. And even do, just do the right thing for yourself, you know, for you, who you are, you know, a lot more freedom. And, and in these times of COVID where we're kind of on lockdown and we're sheltering in place and we're not able to get out, do you have any extra bits of wisdom to share? Uh, as far as the COVID is concerned, well, you know, of course, you want to follow the protocols, right, of what, you know, the people who are experts in this field are telling us to do, you know, and to be mindful of, <clears throat> be mindful of those things. And because it, it makes a difference when we are all, all are following the protocol, because now the virus has a less of a chance to keep, you know, going, you know, prolif proliferating. So, um, but 
far as from a ther therapy point of view, this is a, a fantastic time right now to get into a lot of like, um, to start investing into yourself. It's a fantastic time. You know, there's yeah. all kinds of stuff that you could be reading, you know, you know, all those different types of things. So, um, those online classes that you want to take and build up some more skills, talk to people like yourself, because now this is going out to other people listening to these type of podcasts, you know, are fantastic and asking questions, not just letting it sit, you know, but, and here's the other thing too, Jen, is that the problem that I find, not the problem, but the, the thing that makes people successful in therapy are the people who do the homework. Mm. Mm -hmm. They go through the rigor. The tough is hard. It's not easy. But they go through the rigor of doing the homework, following through, right? So none of the stuff that we're talking about, silence and critic and all those different types of things is easy. It takes a lot of work to do it, you know, just like it takes a lot of work to do West Coast swing dance, right? Or to be a drummer or a bass guitarist. It's just not going to, some people are just that talented to where they can pick up a bass and, you know, a few less than they're, they're like spectacular, but those are far and few in between. Amen. Yeah. Most people have to work super hard at it for years, you know, and um, I forgot, it, I forgot who wrote that book, but um, they called it the, um, the magic, the magic number. And I think it's 10,000 hours that you have to put in in order to be, to master oh, something. Good point. Malcolm Gladwell, tipping point. Malcolm Glad Gladwell, yeah, right. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, he has some great books. Outliers, tipping point. Outliers, yeah, yeah. Yeah, he's got other stuff, but yeah, those three books just are like boom, boom. They're just yeah, yeah. Ten thousand hours of practice. Mm -hmm. Ten thousand hours, and that takes it takes a long, long time. But Michael Jordan, Tiger Woods, you know, all these greats, right? People who are Steve Jobs. All Steve Jobs, those guys, those people who are at the top of the game are the ones that have poured their heart and soul into the thing. They yeah. gave up all the sacrifice that it takes to do it. So um, your your question, it kind of led me all the way down this path because that's, you know, as far as, as, far as advice goes, man, get on that 10,000 hour bicycle and just keep going. You know, uh -huh. there's... There's not much time to, to, you know, to waste. Right. Because we only have so much time on this earth. You are so full of some good stuff, man. I'm going to have uh, to do this again. Hope you don't mind. Oh, yeah. Big time. Yeah, this was great. Well, I we're know. on a, two hours. I know, right? It, it, it just flew. See, this is the thing. It's like, I hope that anybody watching, I kid you not, I really hope that they just feel like they're part of our conversation. This is too. just yeah. two friends connecting and yeah. and welcome to our little circle. Sit around sure. the table, have a drink and join us. It's just, yeah. you know, good stuff. Yeah, I, mean, I, would hope I, they, I would hope that they call you or talk to you, you know, send a little chat or something like, hey, what did you mean by this? Or, hey, I had a thought about this. You know, they can contact me also, you know, so. In fact, hey, let's, let's put it out there. Someone wants to contact you. How does one do it? www.montrelljamari.com. It's M-O-N-T-R-I-E-L-J-A-M-A-R-I. That's my website. Um, you can contact me through, and then they have my, it has my email address, M-V-J, enter, I-N-N-E-R, strength, S-T-R-E-N-G-T-H, coaching, at gmail.com. My phone number is 1-800-895-6926, 1-800-895-6926. If you call that number, I'm not going to whisper sweet nothings in your ear. Maybe something <laughs> a little bit more better than that. Um, yep. I love it. I love it. So this is great stuff, and uh, I'm I'm excited. Yeah, I'll put this I'll put this on here so people can read it and see it. Right. Yeah. Julia, you are phenomenal. MVJ Inner Strength Coaching. What's the V for? 
Uh, Von Tay, that's my middle name. What's your middle name? Von Tay. Ooh, I love it. I love yeah. it. Yeah. Most valuable Jamari is how I wrote it. I like it. I like it. <laughs> that works. <laughs> that works. Be on the lookout for the book, The Inner Critic, is coming out pretty soon. The Inner Critic. I love mm -hmm. it. Okay. You are a treasure. I adore you. I'm writing this all down so we can um, we can share this with everybody. Truly, Monty, I love you, man. You are this a brother. Love brother. you too. Love you too. Yeah, this was wonderful. We can dance with you again. Let's dance. Oh again. man. Right with gloves and, and, and masks. Oh. We'll be like, we'll be like oh. I'll be like, How are you? <laughs> the smoke will just come off your nose then. I mean, it's not. It's, <laughs> yeah, my joke will not carry over well. Uh, yeah. Well. Yeah. Yeah. It'll be great. You can't really remember that one time. I don't know if you ever did that with me, but like I had the, um, the, the candy cigarettes tucked into my shirt. Oh. <laughs> you ever seen that? No. Actually, I mean, I saw it once. Gum cigarettes, and I had the candy cigarettes, and I it was at Monterey Swing Fest, and I whip it out, and I'd like. The problem was, this is the bad thing about my joke. It didn't work out so well because I was sweating. Oh, it. oh. Yeah, the the candied ones, how uh, you you can like, and this uh, the powdered it sugar work, yeah. goes off. <laughs> didn't work. It was a didn't work. Bus. Oh. I would have fell out laughing if I would have saw but that. That's okay. I still had the cigarette, and then I and then I started chewing on it. That is the worst tasting gum <laughs> ever. <laughs> it's like cardboard, huh? No, oh, it's horrible. Like three Awful. chews, and you're like, ugh. <laughs> Start crumbling in your mouth. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's okay though. It's my own little joke. Everyone's oh, really it's hilarious! Hilarious! I love it. I love you, man. Hey, Love you. thank you so much. Everybody, thank you for watching me and Monty just connect and have a good old time. Truly, I hope you enjoyed it. If you want to get in touch with them, please do. And and truly, welcome, welcome to our world and start dancing with us. West Coast Swing. Go look it up. It's not what you think it is. It's better. <laughs> <laughs> all right. See you all later. Bye. All right. yeah, thank you.